Good afternoon. Oh, wait a minute. We need to have Nam count us down. Nam, could you count us down? I'm live. Okay. All right. We're all set then. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to the July 24th, 2024 special Northampton School Committee meeting. I am Gwen Agna, the vice chair of the school committee, and I will be presiding in the absence of the chair as this meeting was scheduled at a time that she had another commitment. This meeting is being done remotely on Zoom pursuant to the modification of the state's open meeting law for the pandemic. This meeting and all participating will be audio and video recorded. I'll begin by asking the clerk to please call the roll of the school committee. Just one second, I'm letting Michael Stein in. Uh, pause. Actually, everyone should be allowed in at the beginning of the meeting. I and did. So, Gwen, these are new. These are new folks. Okay. So, but everyone is should be allowed at the beginning of the meeting. And okay. So, do, should I repeat what I just said? Is that so? Is everybody out of the waiting room? Oh, there are two. There are more in the waiting room. Yes. Yeah, so. so so Gwen, you will have to begin the meeting again there ever. Okay. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to the July 24th, 2024 special Northampton School Committee meeting. I am Gwen Agna, the vice chair of the school committee, and I will be presiding in the absence of the chair as this meeting was scheduled at a time where she had another commitment. This meeting is being uh, shown remotely on Zoom or held remotely on Zoom pursuant to the modification of the state's open meeting law for the pandemic. This meeting and all participating will be audio and video recorded. I'll begin by asking the clerk to please call the roll of the school committee. Mayor Shara. Member Gacy. Present. Member Foster Cannon. I thought she was here. Okay. Yes. Oh. Thank you. I just, my mouse wasn't working. I couldn't get to the unmute. I am here. And can you make me a co host? I thought I did. Hold on one second. And just acknowledge that the mayor has joined for at least a little bit of the meeting. Um, I will continue to chair unless she would like to take over the gavel. Karen, I'll get right back to you. Emily Serafi Cox. Present. Michael St Member Stein. Present. Member Hennessy. Present. Member Miller. Present. Member LeBounty. Member Agna. Present. Member Davis. Present. And I'm also here if you called me and I wasn't able to unmute yet. Yes, I heard. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thanks. The so, Mayor, would you like to do the gavel at this point? You know, if I'm in a car um, and uh, on my phone, which is, I struggle with on Zoom. So if you are willing to do it, that would be, yes. I'd be grateful. Thank you. That's fine. That's great. And I, I want to apologize for that um, Zoom bomb that we just had. And hopefully oh. we will have another one. But I think what I did was just cancel the video. I don't know if that's what helped to get rid of it, but we will continue to work on that. Um, so according to our agenda, we will now enter the executive session. Cassie, will you put all those who are not members of the school committee into a waiting room or whoever can do that? We will return to our open meeting after oh, this session. Sorry, Chair. Um, we need to make a motion first. I know. I was going to ask. Oh, okay. that. Yep. Gotcha. Sorry. Um, we will return to our open meeting after this session. Our plan, according to the agenda, is to return and to adjourn at 6 p.m. May I have a motion to enter the executive session? I'll motion. Second. Okay. Uh, believe, Member like, Davis. Motion. And Member Davis did the second. Okay. Um, and, can, 
Don't you have to read the entire thing out? Yes. Can we read the, um, we need to read the purposes. Okay. That are agenda, please. Um, let me just get it up. Sorry that I'm less than. Okay. So we want an executive session, which will be to discuss impossible vote. Is this from the agenda? Pursuant to MGL Chapter 30A, 21A1, Purpose 1, to discuss an open meeting law complaint against the school committee filed by Paula Regano Murray on July 5th, 2024, and a discussion and possible vote pursuant to MGL 30A, 21A7, to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant in aid requirements, purpose seven, for the purpose of reviewing and approving executive session meetings to comply with the open meeting law, general law C30A 22FG. Okay, I know we did it all in the wrong order and I will fall on my sword on that. If we can go ahead now, we have had the first we've had the agenda um the motion and we've had the second and now we need people to get into the waiting room the roll call i think so, yeah. Call. yeah yeah okay you're you're good just roll, we just need a roll call to enter executive session and, and real also, quick i'm sorry before we do that there's some meeting settings i need to update cassie i, I know you're trying to do everything if you can make me a co-host i'll do that so that the yeah. meeting settings are there i did i did i did I will check I'll on check, my I'll screen check. that you were the co-host, Karen. Jeez, I don't have access to any of it. Um, um, maybe our, Karen host. Um, Karen, are you trying to disable the chat? Is that what you're well, there, We need to, there's usually some security settings we do. We disable the waiting room. We disable the chat. We um, make it so that only a co-host can unmute. Um, it just helps the meeting flow. So uh, I'm just, I don't have, those. Oh, I'm sorry. They've moved. Forgive me. I'll do that silently in the background here. Do you want me to start putting people into waiting room? The waiting room. Yes, please. Okay. And I'm not letting anyone in from the waiting room now, correct? I would say correct if if um, how we're doing this is moving people into the waiting room as opposed to us going into a breakout room. That's fine. Okay. Getting there, you guys. Next time, it actually probably would have been easier for just us to go into a breakout room. So we'll remember that for next time because you're putting each individual participant. I in. am. Okay. I'm Keep sorry. Other folks, if other folks want to help.
before we go into our executive session and we will do our own breakout room so that you will continue to be on this Zoom, which will make it a lot easier. So could we have a roll call, please? Mayor Shara. Yes. Member Gacy. Move, come back. Member Foster Cannon. Here. Oh, no, yes, sorry. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Member Hennessy. Member Miller. Present. Member LeBounty. Uh, no, Member Miller, you're, we're voting yes or no on the yes. motion to go into executive session. Okay, yes. Member LeBounty. Yes. Member Agna. Yes. Member Davis. Yes. And I. Okay, so could you put us into the breakout room and everyone else will stay in the Zoom? Us into a break.
discussion of approved FY25 budget. And is Bobby here to speak to that? And resume recording. I think I that she did. Bobby is, she's present. Okay. I see it says recording paused on my screen. It does say that. If Cassie didn't this make meeting it is being recorded. Great. Could we have Bobby since she's the agenda and then have um or do you have something, Mike, that need I mean member Stein that needs to be said now? No, no, I can wait. Okay, great. Um let's have then Bobby. Hi, Bobby. I think we need you to make you a co-host. Done. Okay, that worked. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Um, so basically, I think you all have had enough time to review the um, budget documents. Everybody got everything. Um, and, you know, I'll just take your comments and, and see where we go from here. I just do think that we put through a... Um, you know, a thoughtful budget and worked with our administrators and our department heads in order to do so. So I'll just open it up to the floor now if. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah. Okay, um, Member Stein. Thanks. Um, I just, I hope um, as a committee we'll devote uh, enough time to this conversation. I know there's a a 6 p.m. end listed here. And I know we didn't want to continue and have this conversation a month ago. And this is our last chance to really weigh some very difficult options. So I hope we stick around and do that for as long as it takes, as long as we have a quorum. Um, and I just wanted to first uh, read into the public record the most recent reduction in force. So the positions that have been eliminated as part of the mayor's budget. Um, I'm gonna read these down. And um, I know there's a lot of confusion out there about what has actually been cut. And I also wanna put these on the table for all of us because I'm going to argue we should restore or some of these positions and make other cuts. Um, so I want us to have uh, an understanding of what, what these are. So just uh, give me one second while I pull up the list here. And I've, I'm gonna read these by unit or school so we can group them together. So at Bridge Street School, um, there was uh, one FTE first grade paraeducator eliminated, um, one FTE school year clerk eliminated, one FTE math interventionist. So that's about 145,000 and change from Bridge Street. Jackson Street School, there was one FTE first grade paraeducator, uh, 0.5 school year clerk, and one grade level teacher, one FTE. That was 110,392. At Leeds, um, we lost one FTE first grade paraeducator, 0.5, so one half FTE library paraeducator, one full FTE grade level teacher, one FTE special education teacher, one FTE math, math interventionist for a total of 292,000 and change. At Ryan Road Elementary, we lost one uh, full-time FTE first grade paraeducator, 0.5 um, one half FTE library paraeducator, one full FTE special education teacher for a total of 126,000 and change. At JFK, we lost um, one FTE physical education teacher, one FTE Spanish teacher, one FTE tech integration specialist, one FTE math interventionist, and one FTE math coach. Um, without the math coach's salary, because I couldn't find it in the book, 
Um, we're at 245,000 and change. At NHS, we lost one FTE school year clerical worker, one FTE English teacher, and one FTE adjustment counselor for 205,000 and change. Central office, um, we had a reduction of 0.2 in the registrar position from 0.9 to 0.7 and a reduction in the school committee clerk position by 0.5 for a total of $57,852. Um, in total, we eliminated 19 full-time positions, three part-time positions, and we reduced two other positions as part of the, the mayor's budget. Um, so that's the list of cuts we're talking about today. And I'm interested and have some ideas about different choices we may make. Um, I would say that I'm I'm very concerned about all of these cuts, and I just want to acknowledge that we are in the land of bad choices. All of these positions are valuable. Um, this is about the positions. It's not about the people. Um, it's about trying to do the most good for our students uh, under conditions of austerity. Um, and, you know, I would also know only one of these positions that's been eliminated was ESSER funded. None of the other ones were. So um, as we go through this, I'd like to think about some of the other remaining ESSER funded programs that are continuing at the expense of some of these positions. Uh, I'd like to talk about some other administrative uh, reductions um, that might put more targeted interventionists and educators in front of our kids and i um, looking forward to the conversation. Thanks. Um, member Serafi Cox. I see Cassie's hand up. Cassie. Oh, Cassie. <laughs> yes. Uh, you're muted. There, on me. Oh, no, you muted yourself. OK, there. you're good now. Now I can talk? OK. Yeah. Yeah. Member Stein, were you reading from one of the um, files that was shared with us by Portia? I, excuse me, Dr. Bonner, or yeah, it's that. Um, yes, Dr. it's the, it's one of those files. Um, okay, it's, and it's um, but it was just organized by um, school or unit, so it's out of the order of that file, but it's all the same information. Um, but the the dollar figures come from. The budget files that Bobby shared with us. Okay. But I can send you a copy of what I read. Very thank you. Yeah. That'd be swell. Thank yeah. you. Okay, now member Serafi Cox. Sure, thanks. Um I um I recognize uh you know what um what Bobby was saying that you know this is a thoughtful uh thoughtful budget and I I know that lots of thoughtfulness went into it and um, definitely don't want my uh, the motion that I'm about to make to feel um, uh, as though it negates that uh, thoughtfulness or that I don't respect that thoughtfulness um, but uh, as you know as I've stated since the beginning of this process my priority was for student facing positions um, and, and that's what I, um, am hearing from, you know, our constituents. Um, I am pretty sure that's what many of our other school committee members are hearing as well. Um, and so I offer these as, uh, offer this, this motion as, um, changes to the budget that has already been approved, um, as a way to, um, exercise that uh, um, that prioritization a little differently than the than the current budget does. Um, so I um, I'll list out first the positions that I want to restore and then I will list out the um, the cuts that I would suggest and I recognize that um, well, two things. One is um, the numbers that I had been using to calculate are maybe a little different than the numbers that 
were in the most recent um, um, numbers from, from Bobby. So uh, my numbers may be off just a little bit. And also uh, I am hoping to restore about $20,000 more than uh, what I've identified in terms of cuts. So uh, bear with me with, with those discrepancies. Uh, this is a very complicated process, at, which is why, you know, Bobby has, um, <laughs> uh, has so many numbers running through her head at all times. Um, so the, the positions that I, uh, I'll make a motion to restore, um, the, uh, I'll go through them by school. Um, at Bridge Street School, the first grade paraeducator, uh, at Bridge Street School, the math interventionist. At Leeds, the 0.5 library paraeducator and the math interventionist. At Ryan Road, the 0.5 library paraeducator. At JFK, the math interventionist. At Northampton High School, the English teacher and the adjustments counselor. And could you say what the total of that is? Do you know? Well, what I was, what I had as that was four hundred sixty-six thousand sixty-eight dollars. Um, but as I mentioned, there were some discrepancies. So let me see if. I bet it's gonna, well, we'll see if this works. My, put my, uh, my Excel, no, that didn't work. Okay, uh, I'll have to get back to you on, on the other set of numbers. Because for instance, the first grade paraeducator at Bridge Street School, I had previously listed as a $30,129 cost, but in the June 26th um, version, it said 36941 So like some things like that, and, and like some of them are smaller numbers and some of them are bigger numbers, but it's somewhere in the vicinity of 450000 Okay, so that's a motion. So that's the those are the positions to be restored, okay. and then the uh, the cuts that that I have identified. Um, and again, I recognize that this cannot be the full motion because uh, it does not balance completely. Um, so the two Essers funded programs at the high school. Um, the Gateway to College and the Dual Enrollment enrollment Programs. Those were ESSERS funded programs, is my understanding, or at least one of them was. Um, the um, other instructional hardware line um, at the high school, um, if it's hardware, that sounds like a capital expense. So um, I I would just suggest that, that, that those needs be moved into um, into our capital lines. Um, as much as it pains me to, to say, uh, the family engagement coordinator, um, and I, I, I'm a little confused about what the, if the ELL part of the family engagement coordinator's position is in that same light item, or if that's just if her, if part of her position is listed under family engagement coordinator and part of it is listed as the ELL, um, that I wasn't quite clear about. Um, but a reduction, at least in the family engagement coordinator, um, an elimination of the direct, director of curriculum position that is currently vacant, and uh, a reduction in the business office support line item of $50,000. And then, so those are reductions mm -hmm. in the budget. 
Um, and then uh, it's my understanding that, you know, from our guidelines that, uh, that no more than $350,000 of the uh, stabilization fund, uh, you know, can be used in a given year. We used 200,000 of it this year. So that does um, have a $150,000 remaining balance or, you know, like remaining as it were allowed amount. Um, and while um, that's specifically for special education, many of these positions are specific to special education as well. Um, so I can, you know, I can kind of talk about the specifics about that um, as well. But I, I want to make sure that uh, Kath, especially Cassie has has all the information that she needs for the notes. So I'm going to suggest that perhaps rather than second the, um, the motion that we hear from the superintendent and Bobby about some of the questions that you raised. Sure. So, so that everybody has clarity about the motion. Is that agreeable? I'll, I, uh, I'll, second I mean, the, I'll second the motion so we can have discussion on it. Yeah, that, that's what I was just going to say is usually that's how it's done. Okay. Can I have a, a, I don't know what the question is, Emily, when you have a question about the procedure right now, it's not about what you're saying necessarily. I, I see in our agenda, we don't have a vote. We're just discussing. So do we still need to make motions? Um, cause I thought this was just a discussion. There's no vote. That doesn't Can mean you... a vote isn't allowed. Okay. So you're making a mo Okay. I thought we had to have vote on the agenda if we were going to vote on something. I thought that was, I thought, but you, you're the parliamentarian. I thought that was an open <laughs> meeting. I thought that was a, a rule that if we're going to vote on something, it has to be posted on the agenda. Um, that it has to be posted on the agenda as the topic, but that uh, votes can, um, I believe the way Layla put it is they, uh, if they flow naturally from the discussion. Right. Can I, I need clarity, please. Yeah. Can um, you, in your cuts, uh, you mentioned family engagement coordinator, and then I got a little confused. Is that it? Family engagement coordinator. Family engage engagement coordinator, director of curriculum. Got that. Okay. And yeah. the use the balance in what account to the, the special, special education stabilization fund. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that motion was made by Member Sarvi Cox and seconded by Member Stein. Um, Dr. Bonner. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you to member Stein and, uh, member Serafi Cox, um, for your, for your thoughtfulness in terms of how we can, uh, restore some of the positions that were indeed lost during, um, the budget process this year. So there's just a couple of clarifying points before I, uh, speak to what you've listed out. Um, member Seraphi Cox. So first of all, just clarify clarification, you only mention first grade paraeducator under Bridge Street School, correct? Okay. All right. So not under the other ones. Okay. So um, I do want to speak to some of the positions in which you would like to cut in order to restore some of those positions. So first off, um, as mentioned previously in other meetings, the gateway and dual enrollment program, uh, yes, it was originally ESSER funded, but it was a recommendation to maintain this program because it was a unique way to allow our students who may not meet the requirements to take Smith courses to also have access to college bound level courses. And so this current, this past year, not current year, this past year, there was 134 students that were enrolled in that. So, uh, and in the mix of that, there were majority were low income students of color, 504s and IEP students. Um, so I just want to point that out to you that this was a program um, that although you're hearing recommendations to cut, 
I would feel that that would be inequitable. And we would then now students who normally would not have access will now have nothing. Secondly, uh, you mentioned the instructional hardware line and possibly moving that to capital expenses. So there's a concern there. So if these are recurring costs, that cannot go into capital. Uh, and I'm sure Bobby will speak to that more um, after I finish talking. So the family engagement slash EL coordinator, that is a, a dual purpose position. Um, so um, I, I would like to speak to that, particularly uh, major concerns here that the family, the family engagement EL coordinator uh, leads the district in differentiation and instruction for multilingual learners, uh, connects us to our multilingual families, uh, grows programs to improve family engagement and communication. So for instance, she was one of the leads on Parent Square this current past year. She's running our summer program and assists with the sheltering of families that are newcomers into our area. She engages and connects us to families, communities, and support services and resources. She handles our Title III, which we were a part of a consortium. Well, this year, she will be writing that grant on her own. Uh, we have a growing EL population that we will need assistance to, to address their needs. Student support, screening, and placement. She manages our ESL staff. She handles the access, which is our assessment, our annual assessment for our, our students who are uh, exiting out of our ESOL, um, ESOL programs. And so there is a list of, of roles and responsibilities that that position handles for the district. And I do want to point out that um, not only in strategic planning, but it, prior to me coming into the district, that there is an area of priority in terms of addressing our EL students in, in the areas of reading and math. And not to have this position would be a major, major concern. Uh, and I'm sorry to interrupt, Dr. Bonner. I just want to clarify, I wasn't saying to get rid of the EL oh. position part of it. That was my question is, is the family engagement coordinator line item that's there just for the family engagement portion? And then the EL coordinator portion is listed separately, or is that her entire salary? All right. So Bobby, 50, 53 to 13. I'm sorry that I don't no. have that as a clear question. So, so Bobby, yeah. before I go on, do you want to answer that component in terms of the actual dollar amount and the line item that's been set aside for that position? So yeah, that is in two two spots. Um, oh, yeah. So they're that's each right. 53. I think it was 53213. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're in two different spots in the budget. So one for the EL and one for the family engagement. Yeah. yeah. For that position. Okay. So then there, there are three other points remaining. So the director of curriculum instruction. So as you know, that position is going to be vacant um, the middle of August. I did not post pending this conversation, knowing uh, that there is a potential. So um, again, although these positions that you listed, listed are beyond the classroom, they impact the classroom. So to talk a little bit about the director of curriculum instruction, Okay, Emily, you're frozen. I just want to make sure I'm not frozen. Okay, so just to talk about this position, the role of this position works under the leadership of the superintendent in collaboration with the directors and the principals to lead and guide the district in curriculum. The dis and that is the district's course of study, pedagogy, scope and sequence and standards. It is this position that works directly with staff to help them meet content standards. Loss of this position would affect curriculum work, which is a, a constant flowing cycle of updates and revisions to curriculum to meet changing standards and to be more culturally responsive uh, to the needs of our students. Uh, this position also handles grants, uh, primarily the ESSA entitlement grants, which is our Title I or Title IIA, Title IV, and works with the private schools in this area under the ESSA, ESSA, not ESSER, ESSA entitlement grants, and procures other grants for the district. This position also coordinates and supervises professional development, 
in our district, we have two full days and two half days, along with also the professional development that happens during the course of the school year. She meets or, or that position meets with department chairs, um, handles school data teams, along with the principals. Um, in terms of planning the PD, she facilitates the PD committee for the district. She coordinates assessments for the district and keeps us abreast of student performance. So, and I do need to point out uh, an addition that's going to happen this year is that we have been selected to participate in NAEP, which is an additional assessment for some of our um, schools this year. She helps with the teacher evaluation in terms of setting standards. Uh, also assists with new teacher orientation and the mentor program, even though that there is a coordinator of mentors, she is the one who facilitates that. She also assists with state reporting. Uh, and so this position helps us to close that opportunity gap that we are seeing in the midst of our students. And so um, it's a it's a concern. And plus with our strategic planning, there is an academic component in terms of addressing those gaps to have a loss of this position would be a great concern. You mentioned reduction in the business office. I spoke to this last time we were together and this was mentioned and we talked about uh, succession, succession planning and knowing knowingly that there will be three uh, individuals in that department that will be retiring. And so we have been training and um, working with individuals to be able to keep some of the historical knowledge in that department and would ask that you would refrain from any reductions until those changes are made and that we review uh, a quick feasibility study in terms of how that would be managed. Also, you mentioned the use of more money in the special education stabilization fund. Um, and so this fund is specified, is intentional for special education needs. The positions that you listed are not necessarily special educational needs. So for instance, a math interventionist is someone who helps from tier one all the way to tier three. Uh, the, so um, it's not just germane to special education. Adjustment counselor at the high school, interesting enough, this particular position is for uh, general education students not necessarily for those students with special needs. So to utilize those funds would be inappropriate based upon uh, what that that agreement or ordinance stated. And so it point, may point not- of, Just a point of information, just to be clear, I understand that that's what we said, but we're also running $200,000 for that for general budget. So this idea that that can't be used for anything else, we're already violating in the budget we already passed. So please like save it, like save it. Like it, yes, I hear you. And we're, the money we're taking from it already is literally just Medicaid reimbursement we're using for our regular budget, not for special education. So then to say we can't take another 150 for positions that will limit the amount of students going onto IEPs seems a bit rich. So let's just be honest about how we're using the fund already. It's, we can say whatever it says, we're doing different things already. Okay. So, uh, Chair, I would ask that people be recognized so that I'm not interrupted in the middle of my statements. And then to also- of order, I was using Robert's Rules of Order, which is part of our process. I can offer a piece of information by raising that point, just as I offered a piece of information of order on the rules. This is in compliance, and I don't need the Chair to recognize me. We accepted Robert's Rules of Order as our operating procedures. Okay. okay. Let's just go forward now, please. Thank you. Thank you. Because normally the interruption starts with the point of order, which was not stated. It was a complete interruption. So with that being said, order, it was with that being said, that Bobby will actually will clarify that statement. about the rules, statement. get clear on them. It was a point of information, okay. not a point of order. They're okay, it's, okay, let's record that in the minutes and we'll go forward now, please. Thank you. So I will ask our business manager to give a point of clarification in terms of how those funds will be distributed in the budget. And it was not made to be a general addition. It was you, it's going to be used for special education positions. Okay, so 
I wanted to make those statements. I know that I can only recommend to this body, but I do want to point out that uh, I really have concerns of organizational practices in terms of the vulnerability of non-union positions in this district and a lack of protection of the position, even when they are contracted. And so I hope that uh, as you are uh, processing this and thinking about this uh, and making these decisions, you're also not only thinking about the now, this moment now, but I'm hoping you're thinking about years to come. Like uh, we're gonna be in the budget season in about four months, not even probably less than that. So, you know, we are here at this point and you're gonna restore some of these positions only to be lifted up again, some of them, not necessarily all of them, with potential cuts next year. So I'm hopeful that you will be thoughtful in your decision and deliberation this evening in terms of that. And I've spoken to those positions in terms of what you're thinking about uh, in terms of swapping out and, and the restoration. And so that's all I have to say. Thank you, uh, Chair, for allowing me to speak. Thank you. I wonder if um, Bobby Jones wants to speak to anything before we go to the rest of the members. Sure, I can clarify a couple things. Okay. Um, uh, one on the other instructional hardware, um, to Emily's point about it perhaps being in capital, um, that won't necessarily work because it is for um, like a multiple of things, generally like monitors or printers or projectors, um, that sort of thing that might not ne actually meet the criteria um, for a capital. So that's why that line is there so that they can replace other hardware items that they have not, and it would be recurring. So it's kind of a replacement. Um, but in any. I think you're frozen, Bobby. Can you hear me, Bobby? Hello? Hear me? No. No, I can hear you. Yes. Oh. Do you want to try turning off your video and see if that works for you? Yeah, let me try it. Okay. Okay. Any better? Yes. Okay. Um, so did you get everything I said about instructional hardware or no? No. Okay. So the other instructional hardware could be for items such as projectors, printers, monitors, um, that sort of thing that might not necessarily fit in with a capital plan. Um, so the capital plan is usually a threshold of at least 5,000 with five years of useful life. Um, so that's what that line is for. I don't know that it would fit within the capital. Um, and then the we straightened out the family engagement coordinator that was in two spots. Um, I do want to make a comment about the business office just to know that if we do let go of even one person in the business office, um, which you've heard me already say that we could. Oh, now we can't hear you again, Bobby. Can you hear me, Bobby? Hello? Hello. Okay, now we can hear you again. Hello? I wonder if it would work for you to call in? Is that another alternative? We go to the floor. Let me let me do this here. Okay. Um let's see, Portia. Well, let's not delay if Bobby can return when you can return and let's go to member Davis. 
yes, I just had a, a point of clarification that um, can I try that? Fortunately, should I pause? Are you back? Should I wait? Bobby? No. She's trying to relocate herself uh, okay. in the room. She just texted me. Okay. Bob, you, you might want to call in. Yes. And in the meantime, Ms. Member Davis. Okay, so I, I think my point of clarification might be best answered by Bobby, so that might not be good. But my question had to do with, um, as um, Member Serafie Cox had mentioned that idea about the, the special ed um, fund, and I was, um, wasn't that voted on by the city council and so even if we all said, hey, that's a great idea, is that one of those pieces that would need to get sent back to the city council anyway to get their go ahead to switch how we used it anyway, right? So it, I'm, I'm just wondering, I was thinking that um, if ordinance is the right word, I'm not sure, but I was just, it made me think, wonder if that was part of what the process would be. So it is to my understanding that there is a limit in terms of what um, of the amount that we can use and that uh, that it must be not only our vote, but also the city council has to approve uh, the, and so right now they've approved it a certain amount for us. And that's what we have voted on that same amount. So if you were to do additional amount, it would have to go to city council. That is to my understanding and I will have, um, uh, Bobby to clarify on on that. Are you back, Bobby? No. Okay. Um, Member Miller. What's I just wanted to um, ask Emily as the parliamentarian um, if if she has made a motion on the floor, and I think it was seconded. So now we're into open discussion. And wouldn't that, so wouldn't that mean that we each, when we raise our hands, doesn't that include the superintendent? So that if she raises her hands, it's her turn. Is that not accurate? Um, I mean, generally the, it doesn't matter if there's a motion on the floor or not. Like we, when we raise our hand, you know, then there's a, a staff. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding. I guess your... what I'm asking is that it would seem to me that if a speaker raises their hand and they have the floor, mm -hmm. they shouldn't be interrupting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just that... wanted to clarify because I, mean... I want to also refer us all back to the standards we set for how we behave in session. And I just think it's not okay to interrupt people and have people talking over each other. I would re really request that people take their turns and just wait until the speaker is finished before we interrupt and move on to our turn. Especially for those of us who are hearing impaired it is impossible to process when people are talking at the same time. So that's my request. And I have another comment. Okay. Which... And I'll just say as the parliamentarian, I have no parliamentarian opinion about your question. I only have a, a school committee member opinion. So as the parliamentarian, okay. you know, uh, Got it. I don't have an opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have another separate comment. Um, I, my opinion is uh, certainly I have positions that break my heart to have to cut. Um, I don't have a solution. So I guess my only question would be, and this is a point of discussion for the people to consider. Um, I have suggested this to Dr. Bonner previously, and this was in one of the budget editions, um, that I wonder 
if we have to make cuts, because I, I'm pretty sure we have to make some cuts that wonder about cutting things like extra surplus bonuses that people get for things like being a department chair, coordinating something. If, if any of those extra costs, you know, those bonuses, if they added up to the equivalent of a face-to-face um, position, I'd rather see those cut than see a face-to-face teacher or interventionist or an ESP. I would rather see one of those kept rather than having those surpluses. So that's, I had already, Dr. Bonner knows that I've already suggested that in a previous edition of the ver- of the budget, but it's, I would, add that because I really, it, it kills me to have an English teacher cut and having any elementary school teacher cuts. And we all want all of them, but I know we have to make some cuts. Okay, I'm done. Member Stein. Um, I just wanted to clarify for Member Miller um, the parliamentary issue, which is as part of our rules that we all voted on. It says that we follow Robert's Rules of Order, and Robert's Rules of Order contains a number of provisions where people can be interrupted, including a point of order. This essentially happened earlier this evening when Member Sarafi Cox reminded Member Agna that we needed emotion in a certain way. This is a very common thing. And there's a number of other provisions, including point of information. And only members of our body can raise them under the rules. Um, so just school committee members, not administrators. So if the body wants to change our rules and, and say that we don't follow certain elements of Robert's Rule of Oil, they can do it. But right now, that's the rules that we've approved. And that may be in conflict with some people's understanding of the norms, but those are two different things. Um, So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I also wanted to say that um, we, I'll say again, we're in the land of really bad choices. I heard really good defensive reasons why we shouldn't make the cuts that member Sarah B. Cox is proposing. We can make that argument for every single position on this list. And that's the thing we're doing tonight. Um, regarding the gateway program and the dual enrollment program, I think there are significant pedagogical um, problems and bargaining unit erosion problems when we invite adjunct faculty member into our schools to teach courses on a fraction of what we would pay a core department member. And that's what we're doing with the dual enrollment program. Um, We also have many opportunities for college courses And I actually think we're in the business of providing a high school education, not a college education. And we can't be cutting the core department service delivery in order to offer these things that might be a good idea. So I know the majority of kids have the GPA to attend a Smith class. I know that the majority of kids have the GPA to attend an AP course. Those are college opportunities. Um, There are many opportunities to attend HCC after graduation and all sorts of programs to facilitate that. I can't justify spending $82,000 next year to do that instead of $77,644 on an English teacher, which would serve the same students with different core classes across social studies, history, and English with the way things are flowing. So that's why I would make that choice. Um, I'm worried about losing the director of curriculum, but because we have so many non-unit positions that have contracts that we cannot change. You have to take of the opportunity that's in front of us. And right now, the opportunity is getting back $100,000 to rebudget for frontline positions because that person resigned. Um, I actually think we probably have too many contracts in administrative positions um, when a lot of other non-unit personnel don't have contracts or are at will. 
but the further up the mountain you go, that's not the case. I think that's a whole other conversation to have. Um, and we can have it another time. But I think at this point, we really need the director of curriculum position budgeted money to use. I think it's probably not a great idea to cut 50,000 from the business office, but none of these cuts are good. And it's really frustrating for me to hear about succession planning in the business office when there's no succession planning on how we're gonna have students access counselors at NHS or how we're gonna have service delivery across all these things. Certain things and certain framing over others is problematic to me. So while it will hurt and the business office can decide how they wanna do that, if they wanna reduce a number of positions by a certain amount or eliminate one position, that would be up to them and up to you. Um, and I want to remind us that we cut 13 positions last year. We're cutting another 22 this year. That's 35 positions in two years. And with the budget number and the fiscal stability plan that the mayor has given us, we are looking at massive cuts for this foreseeable future. So unless something changes with the way this city budgets, and unless something changes with the administration, this is the new normal. And we're increasingly going to have to make terrible choices. And I'll also remind you all that when the last override was campaigned on, it campaigned on adding 50-something positions to our schools. And I want to remind us all that none of those positions were built into any budgets. So the override actually didn't pay for them. And now we're seeing what happens. We're cutting now 35 of them through this year. So the solutions aren't working. The problems are getting bigger. And I think what member Sarah B. Cox has offered is more responsible in terms of what it will deliver to our students um, than these other programs. And um, there are risks, right? There are always risks with any cuts, but things are really bad. And I'd like to see some prioritization on student facing positions that will help our most vulnerable students. And I think that's what these restoration. Um, and lastly, like I am concerned with the variances across some of the schools. Um, it's shocking to me that Leeds has more than twice as much dollar cuts than their other three elementary schools. Um, and I don't know how federal reading dollars get broken up across schools. I don't know how any of the internal budgeting works, but it's quite a swing. And I know after um, the lobbying efforts and some additional money from the mayor that they traded places with Jackson Street. Jackson Street had a lot more cuts. Now it seems like Leeds is the outlier. And I know everyone's worried about equity, but this doesn't, it doesn't look good and it doesn't seem good to me. Um, I'm asking you all to find a way to fund more interventionists, more paraeducators, the adjustment counselor at the high school and the English teacher, the high school is so understaffed and we need to do something to help them out. Um, please, let's let's make some cuts that um, will help our students next year. And let's start working on finding ways to change the budgeting process so we're not reliving this last six months and starting in January again, because that's what's on the table. Thanks. Excuse me, um, Dr. Bonner, what is Bobby's phone number? Oh, Cassie, I can't say that publicly. It's at the bottom um, of our participation list. But anyways, um, we're trying to get her in. You got that, Karen? I, I will send it to you. Car so Karen, you Karen, Karen, thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure I make the right person a co-host. Thank you. So I know I know I'm the chair tonight, so I don't have ability to enter this, I think, but I did have a question about eliminating the curriculum director. If that is something that is decided on, who would write all the grants that the curriculum director does? Right? I know that I've in the past there has been a curriculum director and then there hasn't been, but I also know that We've had one now for several years, and the um, amount of money that is written out of the curriculum um, department is pretty significant and may have a huge impact if we don't have that person. Okay. Uh, as I, I'm 
doubling up doing things that people have asked me. So very quickly, Gwen, to respond, uh, excuse me, uh, Chair, to respond to uh, your, your, your question. Um, and also a an assumption that was made earlier. So in terms of the director of curriculum, um, that as as I pointed out, that would be a great loss. And so um, we would have to stipend out or uh, get outside consultants to assist us mm -hmm. um, already. And so the assumption was made that we're not succession planning in other areas, but we are. And so if worst scenario comes tonight where I lose that position, um, already making headway in terms of uh, working with um, someone who will be receiving a stipend to do our title grants, which is the most crit critical um, in terms of um, that it'll be happening in August. This is uh, the, the busiest time for the director of curriculum right now because we're opening the school year. So there's all of the professional development planning and so on. But I know you specifically asked about those grants. We would only focus on the Title I grants that are very, very critical to us uh, that would work on those grants. So we would have to stipend it out. There was a statement made earlier that there's an assumption that we are not doing succession planning in other areas and that's not necessarily true um you know in terms of the adjustment counselor which i know is a, a real concern for many of the members who spoke last last time as being probably a priority for uh reinstatement is that there are outside organizations in which we can tap into to provide those services but again there's still that partnership there will still be some cost but it would not be the cost of a, of a single employee um, that would be in that position. Um, and then we would also search for grants to help with that partnership. And hopefully that they, uh, the, the, the organizations such as River Valley or some other uh, health organizations can assist us with that. Um, but I will say having the conversation with our new principal, uh, out of all the things that were lost at the high school, that was the priority in terms of, of reinstatement first before anything else. Um, I also want to recognize that the ninth grade enrollment uh, is down as projected, and we are at the end of July. So I can't imagine us getting 50 new more students uh, between now and um, uh, the start of the school year. So there is a concern there. Um, and, and I believe that working with the admin team at the high school, they're making the best decisions in terms of what they had to reduce and working with what they um, that what is given to them. I will agree that the high school in terms of the number of staff is understaffed. It's been that way for not just this year, but for many years. I will concur with that. That is true. However, looking at reality and where we are right now, um, we're looking at what is going to be the least impactful that we can work with and reroute in terms of getting things done and being able to sustain and be an effective as we have been in the past for our students. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Member Davis. Hi. Um, oh, hi, <laughs> thank you. Um, I had four quick things that I, as, as people were talking that I noted. Um, I wanted to just address what I heard Dr. Bonner saying with regards to um, the gateway programs and everything. I definitely, I think that's really compelling on both sides of how to handle this, but I'm really hearing Dr. Bonner's um, address equity and um, Member Stein, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe you have data on this, but the whole thing about having a GPA good, um, high enough to go to Smith, like I happen to know for a fact, I know many children that would not, could not go participate in that. Many of my children's peers and other children that I know said, "Ooh, I would like to take that, but my GPA isn't good enough." Like it's just, it's not everybody. Everybody can't do that or have um, transportation to get there. So I just think it's a point to to, to take into account. Equity is important. Um, second, um, 
Member Miller, I'm not sure, but I think that the stipend or the bonuses, I think that might be bargained. That might be part of a contract. And so I think that's less tidy an idea, I think. Although I think it certainly could add up to something, but I think that that's something that would need to get re we looked at in negotiations. Um, and the last idea is something that I've been thinking I should have researched because I don't know if it could help, but I'm getting, I'm seeing letters and stuff from constituents about scheduling at the high school and how hard that is with the cuts of the English teacher, just as an example, with the short staffing. And I'm, I've been wondering if the block scheduling there's a real art to scheduling at a high school or middle school. Like I have no idea how those people do that, but I've been wondering for quite some time if having the kind of schedule that I grew up with was sort of like seven classes instead of four classes. Does that make it easier to get more kids in seats to take classes? Because at the high school right now with the block scheduling, which I know has a whole philosophy behind it of why it was started, but each kid only has four classes and like they're required to take that many Englishes and that many histories and maths and stuff. So probably this is super late in the summer to be pondering that, but if it, if it helps matters to get kids, um, the number of classes they need to graduate, I'm wondering if that's something to, to put out there. That's all, thank you. Okay, does anyone else have a comment that they'd like to make? I just wanna make sure that if anyone who hasn't spoken gets a chance to. Okay, um, member, oh, member Labounty. Um, I, re I really appreciate all the uh, thought and um, careful consideration that my peers have made around these uh, suggestions and cuts. I think because, you know, as Member Stein said, there's no there's no good ones, right? So, um, I also think that there's some that we make by uh, emotion, and some that we make by um, data. Right. And there's some that we're probably qualified to and some we're not. That we have to listen to the people who are presenting them to us because it's the the school saying what it needs or et cetera. So it's very difficult for me. I, you know, wanting to weigh out what's where um where do we put those? You know, how, how do we choose? I can I find it, I find it difficult. Um so one area that I will, you know, sort of give more of a philosophical point on is uh, around the sort of the dual enrollment and the college classes is that I, I believe they are important for access, um, for equity. However, we are giving a high school education. And that is our, has to be, I feel our priority is our high school education. And that um, I think it's um, it's always valuable. Perhaps it is one of the ways Smith could give to us is to give us something. If it's not funds, perhaps it is people. Perhaps it's some other way to do something so that we're not sort of putting money into it or there's some other thing. But I really do think that if it's between a college class for some or an English class for all, then my vote would be to the broader base. Um, that's just sort of a philosophical point that I have, but but both are valuable, and um, I find it I find it a difficult decision. Thank you, Member Labonte. Um, do we have Bobby back? Okay, this, Bobby, would you like to finish what sure. you were? She's gonna. Sorry, uh, um, Member Agna. She's gonna speak via my phone. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So, Bobby. 
turn. We tried this the last time. Mm. No, it's not going to work. And you can't. Let me this here. You, you can't hear me on the regular? No. Yes, yes, we go. yes we can. can. Here we yes. go. Oh, you can? Okay, yeah. I'm going to hang up my phone. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay, Bobby. Okay. So, oops, sorry. Just to go back, um, I think I I think you got everything about the hardware that I had talked about. Yes. Um, yes. So on to the business office. I just want to make you aware that um, if there ends up being a reduction there that we can't realize the full reduction um, for one, their union folks. Uh oh. Okay, we don't hear you again, Bobby. Um, my goodness. She Hi. can't call to you, um, Cassie. I mean, on the agenda, there's a call in. You can use a phone to call in when we do public comment. So, is there a way that Bobby could use that phone number? I was using the phone number, oh, but you it wasn't letting me unmute. Okay, so now you're you're back. We're back again. Okay. Okay, go for it about the uh, business office. So so we'd have to give them a thirty day notice. So we'd have to pay that part of it, um, in addition to what they've already worked into this fiscal year, um, and then, um, would we be looking at? I'm assuming if I think Emily had said about fifty thousand, so it would probably be our full time. That would reduce us to a um, 1.75 um, with an assistant business administrator and one payroll person. So just so that, keep that in mind. Um, then for the SPED stabilization, that was voted on by the um, city council and the school committee, and it did have parameters built into it. Um, we lost you again, Bobby. Around. Okay, we we parameters around. We that's where we ended with your statement. You were frozen. go in there okay are you back can you hear me yes yeah okay so the um sped stabilization had the parameters right which was we could use in the general fund budget up to the amount of what we had i believe in the medicare reimbursement for the previous year um and then the other part which up to the cap was to be used for extraordinary so if we got an extra student in or anything like that. So that's what the parameters were around that. I don't know that we can without going back to city council and getting another school committee vote, use additional money without having those votes. Okay. And did I get everything or is there still something else you needed clarification on? I think so. I think we got everything, but um, if there was anything else, people can um, say that when they are called upon. So I'm going to call upon people who haven't spoken. Um, Member Gazy. Thank you. Um, when is the uh, override that we are contemplating scheduled? It's for the election this November. So... Could we do something like, I think we're going to need a curriculum director ultimately, but can we do without one until we see if we get the override, at which point we might be a little bit more easy to think about hiring a curriculum director? 
do you want to make that as a friendly amendment or we uh, i don't know because we have quite a laundry list on this motion so i'm not sure that um, uh can i ask dr bonner what her dr bonner yes are? yes thank you so if i could speak to that very quickly so that override budget that will not impact until next year so uh, if you would consider allowing me to maybe hire an interim person so that it's a one-year contract or it's, it's a short term um, so that individuals will understand that there is potential that this position may go away uh, next year, I would ask for you to reconsider that so that allows me to at least have someone to assist. Uh, it may not be a full-time person, that's another consideration. We did actually um, reduce the amount allocated to that line, um, that line item, to that position. So um, I would ask that I have some something, and I, I don't want to stipend multiple people. I want one body that I know that I can rely on to be able to um, uh, do this function and to do it well. Um, but I would, if you allow me to move forward with that is to, um, say that it's, it's an interim or acting and it's only for this fiscal year. Um, I would ask that if that is, a, if that indeed is the consideration, but again, to reiterate or to respond to your original question about, um, the override and it's. It will not come into effect until next year, so it will not impact this current fiscal budget for this year. And can can somebody? I didn't hear when we're talking about the family engagement coordinator. There's two parts of that job. One is family engagement. One is all the ELL. How much is budgeted towards the ELL portion? and how much is budgeted for other family engagement? Is Bobby around to give so, that? I know, because so, okay. you're looking at the actual numbers, but the actual time on work for that individual, um, it's an expanse. It actually, you can't say, oh, she spends five hours a day on this and five hours on that. In her role, because it, it outreaches to multilingual families, she's always doing family engagement in that mm -hmm. role, even as EL, if, that, if you understand what I mean, because she's reaching out to families that are multilingual and trying to get them to connect. And she handles the LPAC um, while she facilitates. There's usually someone who um, the body uh, selects to be the chair of facilitator, but she makes sure that that happens. And um, so it's hard to uh, distinguish in terms of how many hours per day in her job or what percentage of her job in, over a course of a year that is family engagement and not. I will help uh, uh, say that she does assist with, trans that this position assists with transition uh, in terms of the different grades as well, um, works with other coordinators to make that happen, um, and works with principals in terms of some of the family engagement events that happen at the schools. So um, hopefully that helps a little bit, but Bobby can actually give you the, the, the money split. Mm -hmm. So the money split is... Um... Oh. Bobby, you started and we lost with the money split. It's $53,213 for the family engagement coordinator part. And I believe it is a similar figure for the ELL part. So what Emily had put in the motion was just for the family engagement coordinator part, which was 53213. Okay. Is there anything else, Member Gacy? Yes. Um, I just want to uh express my opinion that um given the fact that we are facing you know as outlined in Dr. Bonner's entry report findings um uh, our our ELL uh and similar and other groups are struggling and 
uh, down in, uh, you know, that's one of our big points to bring that up. So I, I, I am loath to uh, ditch the ELL portion. I don't know if you can reduce the whole uh, 100K plus to a partial or, you know, whether that's possible. Um, but I have to agree with um, uh, Carrie Labonte, uh, Member Labonte, about the um, gateway to college and dual enrollment, because if we can't get them through high school, you know, I, I think there's more needed on that level than providing other opportunities as much as I like them, but other than that, you know, you sure need your director of curriculum or at least a partial body there. So that's my Thank input. You. I'm going to call on Karen, I mean, member Foster Cannon, only because we did say we would meet from four to six, and I know that there'd be concern that we might go over, but there are this is a July meeting, it's a special meeting, and we haven't had a July meeting in the past, so people had to shift around their schedules, and I know that uh, member Foster Cannon has a deadline, and so I'd like to hear from her now. Thank you. Thanks, member Agna. That was actually one of the things I, I was gonna say. I appreciate that. I do have another commitment and, and need to leave at 6.30. Um, and I just wanted to say as well, in, in terms of this discussion, I, I think, um, you know, Member Stein's point, Member Serapy Cox's point, that we are we are faced with terrible choices, and there's there's no part of me that doesn't accept that, dread it, um, all of that. Um, I also, I guess, I'm a little bit surprised. It's the end of July, and and I the 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 conversations we're having, priority wise, and and questions and checking for understanding. I, I'm a little bit surprised that that this is we're doing this at the end of July. Um, you know, and I'm really grateful for the time that that people have spent with me over the last months, um, asking questions and and making sure I understand exactly what's there and 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 the trade offs and the reason for it. So I I, I think these conversations are really valuable. I'm um, uh, feels very late in the game, um, and you know we've we've had much of this information for a while. I realize you know little details are are coming here and there. Um, um, so I, I I did just want to put that that part out, and as well just to go back to an earlier comment about the um, the stabilization fund, is uh, yes we're using we're using part of that annually in our budget, um, but the re the rest is specifically earmarked for extraordinary and unforeseen special education costs, and so you know we might solve a problem today by pulling from that and and. Um, you know, we have positions here that are are really difficult to think about losing. But what we need to accept and realize is that if we don't save that fund for what it's intended for, the costs don't go away. They're just going to hit us unexpected and without time to consider and plan. So if an extraordinary unexpected cost comes in in October, we talked about this. Member Agna talked about that when she was a principal, the really difficult decisions that get made because we are going to be making those trade-offs without without the time um, to be thinking and planning. Um, so I just uh, wanted to make sure I, I had a moment to say that, um, and and um, you know I'll be able to stay till six thirty. And I regret that I can't participate in the conversation beyond that. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Member Hennessy. Thanks. Um, a few few things. Um, I guess for me, there's not enough money, right? I mean, and so. I think a lot of all of our work and the 60 people or 50 some odd people who are watching it, we need to figure that out um, and talk to our city councilors. And but this is the money we have. I don't think we can depend on an override, though. I support an override. Uh, I support the override personally because it was designed in such a manner. Um, anyway, I support the override. Um, I, I've, I'm sure all of us have contacted the superintendent about questions and concerns that both our constituents have brought to our um, to us, wh whether via email or phone conversations or just conversations. And um, and I feel like that's my role. I'm not an expert um, at all. Um, I, 
I, th some things make sense, some things don't make sense, um, and I know none of us are experts, but we're here to ask questions and to pose um, concerns, which I think we've done since my time in January on this committee. Um, but with that said, and I don't agree with all of these cuts, right? I can, if you were to give me an intellectual exercise to defend each position, I would, I could do that because they're all that important. Um, and I, it's, it's a terrible choice. Um, but I, I think it is the role of our superintendent who's just been here for about a year to look at the district as a whole, to look at each school as an ecosystem um, and that things aren't necessarily um, equal and equitable. I know those are two different things, and sometimes that happens. Um, and so these, I brought my concerns to Dr. Bonner around you know, wanting a math interventionist and a an, uh, reading interventionist at the middle school level. Uh, all of you know I've you know, almost a hill to die in for the um, adjustment counselor at the high school level, and I've received more email than anything about the English teacher at the high school level, and yet I know that each one of those things affects other things. And so, for example, if we were to restore an English teacher, there'd be an effect at a Bridge Street school, right? So I don't see all that in the same way that Dr. Bonner does. Um, my, so that, that's just like a general comment and it's a waste of your time that I probably said all that, but I wanted to say it. Um, I wanna weigh in on the uh, dual enrollment. I agree with member Labonte a lot. And yet, I, to me, it's really a pragmatic thing around so I agree with the equity that everyone said, and it's a high school education, but I think it's a numbers thing too. Which of the positions serves as many kids as we need, that we need? Um, so does the dual enrollment serve, I think she said 134, I'm not sure. And if we were to reinstate the English teacher at the high school, again, that might not be the next priority if we cut that, um, would that many students still be able to be served? Because I do think the high school is, um, we have a, you know, it's a numbers problem there. Um, so I, none of these are good at all, um, and yet this is the money we have, and I, I don't know the cuts. I, I think we're one of the few districts in the region. I'll, I think of Agawam. They have an assistant superintendent who's also the director of curriculum. I look at South Had Hadley. They have assistant superintendent or business manager. I look at Chicopee. They have two assistant superintendents and five curriculum people. Like, there's work that has to be done really practically. And I don't, I'm in no position, Ann Hennessy, is to say that we need that position, that that hundred and whatever thousand dollar position is going to be worth it. I actually have no idea. Um, but I think the superintendent has an idea and, and, and she's not making easy choices on this. So whatever she makes, one of us, all of us, some of us might not like. So that's really hard, but these are just difficult. These are horrible. So um, I, that's that's it. I'm ending there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Stein. Thanks. Um, I just want to sort of pick up on Member Hennessy's point and and just sort of say that is why we're here. We're the superintendent's manager. We're democratically elected. When Push comes to shove, we have to make the hard decisions. And we've been put in this position because the city's budgeting plan doesn't work for the schools. And we locked up $600,000 in this fund rather than use it to fund these positions. That was a choice. Um, we left $2 million in free cash to sit around to November to be recertified when it will join a million and a half dollars in interest a bunch of other end spend money. We had the funds, but political choice is not to actually pay for things. And the override, to be clear, is $3 million. We will only get 38 to 40% of that. We get a proportionate amount um, based on the fiscal stability plan and the portion that we get of recurring revenue, which is only 68% of the city's entire budget. But um, a million change in two years, we're just looking at endless layoffs, even if that passes. And I think we really need to be honest about that. Um, and frankly, there is some trust issues um, with, I'm hearing you say, you know, one version of interpreting Member Hennessy's claim is we need to trust the superintendent's decision making. I have some concerns about that. We were told certain things that, high, that, that schools wanted that when we asked 
leaders of those schools directly, they didn't know what we were talking about. I mean, the trust is broken. Um, and I'd also say, you know, like, we're hearing from everybody. They're asking us to make these decisions right now in late July. And the only reason we're making them right now is because we chose not to make them in June. And the only reason we didn't make them in late June is because the mayor refused to pony up more money over five months, didn't even come up to the first few budgets. So that's why we're doing this so late, and that's why we're doing it now. These were all choices that we had no control over. Um, but I want to answer a few things. So uh, Member Davis brought up the GPA issue. My understanding of the data is since the rollout of SBG, uh, there's been a lot of great inflation to the point where the overwhelming majority of students have over a 3.4, which makes them eligible to attend Smith classes or AP classes. Um, regarding the succession planning, there was a veiled reference that there was assumptions about succession planning. I want to clarify that what I said is the only time we hear about succession planning is defending against other cuts. We don't hear them in defense of other positions not being cut, right? So it's one thing to say, well, we know on the horizon in three to four years, things in the business office are going to look this way, so we're planning for succession. Instead of saying, we know that all these kids won't get counseling services, but we're, we're not planning for a succession to keep that body, the succession plan I heard mentioned was just more outsourcing. Let's outsource this to an entity that can maybe give us some hours. And I'm really weary of the idea that we're outsourcing core services to our students, like classes, to adjunct instructors from Westfield that teach in our building, and we're going to outsource, uh, you know, mental health care to some service providers in the area to maybe somehow step in for that adjustment council. That sounds like the succession plan, but we still need money for that, which isn't budgeted. So I don't know how it came for that either. But we are in a, a, a terrible position, and we can't start solving our problems by outsourcing core functions of our school. That's just like unacceptable. Um, and what needs to happen is the budgeting practices of the city need to change. And we need to think about our needs in a more significant way. And this override will not, it's like lipstick on a pig, right? It's rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic when you run the numbers. So um, we're looking at endless cuts. Um, the other thing I wanna say about dual enrollment is I hear that it's, and I wanna see the data on the populations that's serving in the 134 students, I understand it's very few students who are actually in the gateway program at HCC. But beyond that, every single one of these cuts has an equity issue with it. Our entire district is 30% low income. If you're cutting first grade paraeducators at every school, that's an equity and inclusion issue. If you're cutting interventionists, especially at Bridge Street School in math, that is an equity issue. If you're cutting special education teachers at least, these are all equity issues. Every single one of these budget cuts disproportionately affects the poorest, the, the, the most diverse, the most vulnerable members of our community, every single one. So that hold that up as some justification as to why we shouldn't do away with these dual enrollment programs just feels really hollow to me. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just, I hate to say it, but we're in an undesirable position where the buck stops with us. And I hope that we can listen to our constituents, listen to the staff in our buildings, listen to our own philosophies about what makes sense here and make some different decisions that might impact our students for this year. And then we can all begin fighting for more money in, in the year ahead, because we're gonna be back here again next summer in July doing the same thing. Thanks. Thank you. Any other discussion? Because I think we need to probably call the vote. And I'm a little concerned because there's been a lot of discussion about items on that list, but we do have that motion that we need to vote on. Unless anyone has another idea, I think we need to go forward. Um, Member Hennessy? Can, can someone explicitly? what we're voting on, please. Yes. Um, Cassie, could you? <laughs> um, I might. I'm not muted. Okay. Let's see. Member Serafi Cox made a motion to restore the following positions. At the Bridge Street School, a first grade para 
and a math interventionist at the Leeds School. 0.5 Library Para and a math interventionist at Ryan Road. A 0.5 Library Para at JFK. A math interventionist at the high school, English teacher and adjustment counselor, totaling four hundred and sixty-six thousand and sixty-eight dollars. Cuts. <clears throat> Two ESSER funded programs at the high school, gateway and dual enrollment, instructional hardware at the high school to be moved to the capital line, the family engagement coordinator, director of curriculum, $50,000 reduction in the business office, and use the balance of the SPEDS special education stabilization fund. The motion was seconded by Member Stein. Uh, member Seraphie Cox. She can't unmute. Oh. Sorry about that. I had to come in on a different uh, device, and so that's why I was no longer a, a coach. Uh, co-host. Um, <clears throat> I did that math that I was talking about um, to uh, reflect the um, the numbers on the most recent, um, you know, the mo most recent budget numbers that Bobby had sent out. So the total is not the 466000 it's $455,623. The total cuts that I identified were, uh, it totals um, 40, sorry, 445,213. So there is a difference of $10,410. Okay. Member Hennessy. Um, I'm sorry. This will, will assume that we are able to take the money out of the fund. Is that right, Correct. Emily? Okay, <laughs> great. Can you repeat one more time the JFK? I think I missed one thing that you wanted to reinstate. JFK math interventionist. Thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm going to vote yes on this. I understand hard decisions, absolutely. Um, uh, looking at the list, I think especially the fact that there are three math interventionists being cut throughout the district broke my heart, especially as my daughter and, and some of her friends uh, tell me on a regular basis that they hate math, so. Uh, Member Miller. And you're you're muted, Member Miller. I'm sorry. Um, my question is: You never mentioned Jackson Street School in your either your cuts or your added. You never mentioned them, and I just wondered about that omission. Up. Oh, we need. To, oh, you can't unmute. Okay, can you make her co-host so she can unmute, please? Oh, right. Duh. There we go. Duck. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Cassie, feel free to make me host, too. I'm happy to take over the sort of host duties that member Foster Cannon was doing before. Um, I've been working on Zoom for my profession for like 10 years. So uh, far before the pandemic. <laughs> um, uh, apologies. What was the question? Oh, why not um, Jackson Street? So Jackson Street had um, uh, some positions restored to it that I think were, um, you know, important to restore at that uh, at that school and um, the other. Um, the other schools, you know, were not in that same position. So currently, 
the positions being cut at Jackson Street are the first grade paraeducator, just like at the other elementary schools. Um, I'm suggesting that we reinstate the Bridge Street uh, paraeducator, but uh, at Jackson Street, the paraeducator, half time clerical, and one grade level teacher. So um, they are, um, you know, we're looking at relative parity in terms of the amount of money or the number of positions, the number of full-time equivalents, et cetera, to say Ryan Road or, um, or. I did remember that other schools had lost a full teacher. Yeah, so the my understanding is that there were three grade level teachers that were going to be eliminated and because of um, advocacy from you know some members uh, of this committee um, as well as um, some city council members and of course members of the school com uh, community uh, that two of those positions were restored. Okay, thanks. Member Labonte. Uh, Member Seraphie Cox, I'm, I'm wondering if you are open to all to any friendly amendments about certain positions or or if this is a as is. Uh, <laughs> well, it depends uh, on what the uh, uh, amendment, suggested amendment sure. is. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm, my one concern about the, um, the curriculum person is how much money They've, that position has brought in outside of, you know, um, you know, just a, outside of what they cost, they also brought in a lot of money. And so uh, I'm not sure how long we would want to go without that or hand that off to someone else who's perhaps skill is not doing that. So I guess not having that position is concerning to me because I think it also keeps us on track around the things we need to be doing for students um, making sure that we're following up. So I, I don't know where that work would go. So I, I am concerned about that. So I I don't know how others feel, but um, I have concerns both the financial and then also making sure we're staying on track. Uh, and I so, also then, of course, I'm not sure what I would say to change, you know? <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so not being very helpful. I am not being very helpful, but that is a um, something I guess I want to bring up. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I did not hear an actual friendly amendment in there. I hear your concern. Um, and uh, I, I think at, at this point, um, you know, who writes grants can be, can be changed more easily than, um, than some of these other positions, I guess is my feeling. And Member Stein. <laughs> brief since I think we're heading towards the resolution one way or the other here. Um, I just want to say regarding this, the special education stabilization fund, and I know I brought this up before, but it's the use of SPED as the acronym. It's really upsetting to a lot of people in the disability community. And so I just wanted to say again, if we could try not to use it, that'd be great. I know statutorily the fund uh, under Mass State Law is listed as a special education stabilization fund. I just think that's what it is. I just wanted to point that out. The other thing I want to say about it is um, the entire statute that we set this up under says that these the intention of these funds is only for unexpected, uh, unbudgeted costs, right? And then we decided, um, well, the mayor really decided, well, actually, we're going to just pass $200,000 through it for normal use. And so the way we voted on it, we said, well, we're going to do this. Um, you know, I talked to the associate commissioner for finance at Desi, who basically said, yeah, that's not the purpose. And I've said this to you all before, but the Department of Revenue is not going to come after you. And the reason the Department of Revenue is not going to come after us is because you can use these funds for any legal purpose. You can use any stability fund for any legal purpose. So we're not really handcuffed. Um, and no one is going to tell us except ourselves that we can't appropriate another $150,000 to pay for some of these positions. It's just rules we've put on ourselves. 
Um, and it is profoundly frustrating to me that we locked up $600,000 for the chance that we may get a student who has extraordinary need um, that we need to pay for next year while we have students with many needs this year that we could pay for. I, it, it's like, you know, buying an extended warranty on a car you don't know. It's very bizarre to me as a financial planning tool. Um, and I'm really frustrated about it. The way we've handled those unanticipated unbudgeted costs every year has been with unspent budgeted money. So every we just approved some in June, right? Budget transfers. We, we actually haven't faced this problem and yet we fully funded an account to plan for its eventuality while not paying for the normal operations of our school. Like that's a problem. And I'm saying this all to encourage you to claw back another 150,000 of those dollars and actually fund operations of our school that can make a difference next year. Please, we can make a difference. We can take this vote. The city council can still tell us, no, no, no. But let's at least try to get some more money to help our students. Member Hennessy. Beautiful bird. Um, um, Superintendent Bonner, I'm just wondering if we could hear what your take on if this passes at this time. Um, if that's okay for me to ask that. I, I've actually already spoken in terms of how I feel about those positions. Um, I would wish that you would amend your motion and take each of those additional cuts line by line so that I can, instead of a complete package. Um, and I, you know, I understand the position that you're in, uh, in terms of, um, acquiescing to the constituents that are in your specific wards and what you've heard. But I'm, I'm, but I'm also very, very concerned about the recommendations that have been uh, listed this evening for cuts. And I've already stated why. There's no reason to be repetitive. Um, and I, I am sad to hear the, the, the comments about um, we're here to educate students for you know, high school, but yeah, but we are the, the body that prepares kids to go on to college. And so now um, not having access to, and I, I hear what you're saying about we have, we have staff that can teach those courses, but you're missing the piece about the college credits and having that as a head start when they do go on to college. And there was just a piece in, um, the, the the media about um, dual enrollment programs and how they're taking off and how it has been advantageous for students and for us to go one step backwards by removing this. And I do need to point out that there's actually two programs that we're talking about um, that you might want to save the dual enrollment and maybe remove the gateway program. You know, that's another, another consideration. Um, to to think about um, again after you asked a question about the instructional hardware line moving that to capital well it has already been expressed that there are limitations in terms of what we can bring to capital and capital has we would have to wait another year to make those requests and it's not guaranteed that those requests would be um, uh, accepted. And we already know it's a recurring cost. So um, so that would be a, a, a loss for us that we would not be able to replace. The family engagement piece speaks to our, value, our, our values in terms of now we don't, it, it, it expresses that we don't see that as being a, a pointing it position to communicate with our families and caregivers and that that's not um, uh, an aspect that we are, um, prioritizing, but we're going to keep the EL component, and that'll be a, a, a reduce a reduction in this in the individual um, position. Uh, it's hard to maintain 0.5 staff. I just want to point that out. Um, and then the reduction in the business office. You know, I made my statement there, um, and then 
we're relying on the hope that we will be able to use additional funds from the stabilization um, fund that was just established. So those are, again, what ifs. That's a what if for me. That's not assurance. Um, and so, and then we're doing this, and in four months, we're going to be doing this again. Uh, really concerned about that. Then there are some pieces that um, that you're re restoring in terms of the interventionists. I just want to remind everyone that that is support staff. Yes, it uh, those those positions work with uh, with students directly, but that is support staff. The key staff are the classroom instructors. Uh, we talked about the need for the high school having. Um, more staffing. Well, by rest I just want to let you know, and I think uh, Member Hennessy pointed this out. If we do away with that gateway and dual enrollment, then how will that impact the already set schedule? And where are we going to put those students during that class time? So there's a lot of things that in your decision making tonight is going to impact the planning that was. Um, done during this only one month of uh, the latter part of June into July because of the lateness in the decision making of the budget. And so there have been things put in place to, to be able to get through this year that by you making some of these decisions tonight, it's going to offset. So um, just a concern. Those are my concerns. I am only here to make recommendations. I, I thank you for those of you who, who listened and heard, and I ultimately know that you are the decision-making body, and whatever you decide this evening, we as administrators will go back and we will do what whatever we have to do to get ourselves ready for that opening day. Stein. Yeah, I'm just one thing I'm curious about. I don't know, don't know if we have the data right now is how many students enrolled in the gateway programs currently are enrolled because there's no enough spaces and classes being offered because we laid off an English teacher and then other departments had to stop offering classes in order to cover it. You know, like there's a descending wall, like there's a line of things that happen. And I think, yes, those classes that are enrolled in will then have to re-enroll in actual NHS classes. And philosophically, I think that's a good thing. I don't think we should be outsourcing our teaching to non-core faculty that come in from Westfield State to NHS. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And I, I don't know how it's not bargaining unit erosion, but I don't know how the union hasn't already filed an unfair labor practice over it. So I'll just say that. Um, I, I, all of these things are, are tough choices, right? Um, and I just, I just, I really feel like we need to make, make some here that are going to help students. Um, it is a domino effect. And again, we could have avoided that if we had this conversation last month. You know, we, we are here, right? Let's see what we can do to make a difference. Member LeBounty. Thanks. I think it, what I'm hearing, and that people can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the um, it feels like it's this one package is all or nothing, right? But and I think that there are things that some we'd like and some we would change. So I'm I'm wondering um, because I I think there is real value to some of the things that uh, Member Sophie Cox has, been, has offered up as exchanges but I'm not sure I agree with all of them. So if I'm having to make a an all or none choice, um, I'm not sure how I would go. And so I'm wondering if there is, is appetite to break some things off that, to have that discussion, or if the group wants to just continue with the all or nothing and that's and that's the way we go. So that is up to member Seraphie Cox who made the motion, correct? And is yeah. that what you're about to say? Well, I was just, uh, I wasn't going to say that, but that is also oh. true. Um, uh, what I was going to say was just basically that, like, we're just about ready to vote. So let's go ahead and vote. If it, if it fails, we figure it out from there. Um, 
uh, I suppose if it passes, you could, you know, somebody else could make another motion as well. But this is the motion that I have prepared and, and done the math for. So um, at this point, yeah, this is what I'm offering. But I hear you, Carrie. Yeah. Member Levati. <laughs> Thank you. Member Stein. I was just going to say, if there are friendly amendments, I did hear Member Sarah Cox say she was willing to hear them. So if there's something about this total package that any member doesn't like, and they'd like to ask Member Sarah Cox to change it, she said she would hear it. Whether or not she will grant it is a different story. So um, that's the other option in front of us. So far, no one's offered any friendly amendments. Um, but that would be the other option. The um, friendly amendment... I want to add, um, if Member Sergey Cox will accept it, is, and we're going to have to quickly figure out the math on this, but to add a provision that says, you know, if we do get the 150 or if we don't. So, like, part of this could go forward immediately after our vote, and part of it would be contingent on a city council vote. Um, so, I'm trying to find like a clean math <laughs> uh, on the positions to do that. Um, but this is sort of on the fly. Um, uh, I mean, just eyeballing it uh, to math interventionists, although that's not my ideal solution. <laughs> but but that's... Yeah, yeah, all right, so two, yeah. Okay, let's do that. Two math interventionists would be recalled if the 150 is approved by the city council. And the rest of the positions would be recalled immediately if we voted to make the changes tonight. And uh, and um, just to put in uh, a more a, a finer point on the the piece about the one hundred and fifty thousand from the special education stabilization fund that um, math intervention interventionists, um, well, of course, they're not only seeing special education students; they are seeing special education students. Um, and um, no. I think that was the end of my thought. <laughs> I'm my, sorry, no? Uh, my understanding is math interventions are before that people get to a special education plan. I'm sorry. Uh, when I heard tier one to tier three, I, I, you're right. I'm, I misspoke. Uh, it's uh, what Member Stein had said before about... Um, preventing students from being on IEPs, um, which we know um, yeah, is individual education plans are, um, you know, the, I'm sorry, um, it's getting late. My brain is turning off. I've been working since 5 a.m. <laughs> so I'm not making sense anymore, but thank you for correcting my error. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Didn't mean to correct you also. Can you... Um, I'm sorry, can you clarify the friendly amendment? So the friendly amendment um, that I think was accepted was to, um, this is like a procedural part of the amendment, so we know what to do if it passes, okay? So if it passes, um, we will then have to go to city council and ask them also to approve $150,000. And we're saying that if they approve that, we will recall two math interventionists, which roughly equal that amount of money. If we pass the whole thing tonight, that's what will happen with that piece. And then everybody else will be recalled like immediately if we pass the, the whole thing with the other portion. We don't want it all to be tied to the city council because that will add delay into making changes, right? So um, if we pass these cuts, and we make the other, we swap things. That will we we vote on that tonight. That's what's going to happen. But for that 150,000 piece, that also has to be approved by the city council. So that will hold up whether or not we will get back to intervention math interventionists. Oops, Dr. Bonner. Hey, I am going to ask that once you this body takes the vote, uh, depending on how the vote goes, I am going to ask for um, a priority in terms of how we reinstate these positions because I also need my business manager to check the numbers. No offense, Emily, uh, member Serafie Cox, but I need to make sure that we 
have the right numbers um, and that we are able to actually, this budget is tight as it is, so we cannot have error. So if we re reinstate these positions to make sure that we have enough funding to, to actually reinstate all of these positions, we need to be able to double check that. And so uh, after you've taken this vote, I will ask, uh, depending on how the vote goes, I will ask how we're going to prioritize. Thank you for giving me the 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 information about holding out two math interventionists until the special education uh, um, stabilization plan has to go through council. But I will also want to know which two interventionists are you want me to hold out on. So I'm going to uh, please take the vote. And then I will ask some details regard whatever way the vote goes. Okay, if I may have that, I know that we're getting close to the uh, seven o'clock hour, but I will need that information so that we can move forward. Thank you, um, Member Seraphy Cox. But I just wanted to make sure that uh, that members were clear on the if the hundred and fifty, if not the hundred and fifty. Oh, and Cassie is nodding her head, so that was probably the, the most actually important question I had. Yeah, I'm good then. Um, Member Davis. Member Davis. Um, I'm sorry, because uh, Member Seraphie Cox was breaking up a little bit, so I'm not sure if I heard all that, but I have a, a procedural question. So if we take a vote on this as as it was framed of like an all or nothing or however it was kind of framed that way. Um, and it doesn't pass is there's an opportunity to say yes, except for not this or this and like restart it over or if it passes, then, then that's it for this evening, right? I think. Given the hour, I would suggest that we then, if we need to go back to the drawing board, um, we have a meeting in less than two weeks. And that is a possibility for when we could do this, because now it's already after the, f the fiscal year has started and people are getting paychecks for the, what they're doing right now. So I don't think that oh, it... Totally. I don't think that it would right. violate anything right. that if this doesn't pass... We come back to the table again in our next meeting. Um, Dr. Bonner, do you have something to add to that? All right. No, did, did you see some veins popping out of my forehead? Oh. I just want to. I just want to remind everyone: we are planning classes. Our oh. our our families and caregivers are waiting to see uh, what classes students will have. Mm -hmm. So. I really earnestly need you to make a decision tonight as to what you're moving forward with. And then if the vote does, let's just say if the vote does not pass and you want to then make a new motion with the things that you do want to address, as I said, maybe if you take the motion apart and look at each position individually, that would be helpful. But right now you've got a motion on the floor that needs to be addressed. So right. please go forward with that motion so we can move, you know, see what's going to happen. We don't know if it'll pass or not. And so right. okay. it is a full package that you're getting ready to vote on right now. Right. Thank you. And Member Stein? I just wanted to answer the question quickly about which two interventionists. So based on the original motion, it would be the math interventionist position at Leeds and the math interventionist position at BSS. That would be subject to the $150,000 being approved from the fund by the city council. Member Hennessy. So if we're voting on this, if we vote yes, there we go. If we vote no, either we make amendments or we make different motions or we keep what Dr. Bonner has right now. Because my understanding when we met last is that we understood that this was a really difficult for school, schools to plan if we didn't do this, which is why we bumped it up till 
the end of, we should have done it earlier, as Member Stein said, but here we are. I feel like we need to make the decision now so Dr. Bonner could, and her team could make decisions. Is that right? Like, this is the end game here. Uh, I'm asking. Yeah. Yes. I think, I think that, I think that was the plan, to have this meeting when we wouldn't have had a meeting in July. That was my understanding, too. Right. Thank you. Okay. I think we're ready to call the roll. Cassie, would you call the roll, please? You're, you're muted. I'm getting there. Member Davis. You come back to me. Member Gacy. Member Gacy, you're muted. Oh. Member Foster Cannon is absent. Member Serafi Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Hennessy. No. Member Miller. No. Member Labounty? No. Member Agna? No. Member Davis? No. You have one. Six nay. Two I and two absent. Okay, so here we are. I I think because we had planned for a two hour meeting and now it's a three hour meeting that we begin to think about adjourning. I don't know whether there is any sense or initiative um, part of anyone to return to this. This could be something that you could propose to the agenda setting committee as far as our next meeting, which is on August 8th. I understand the situation that we're in as far as school starting and having to proceed. And I would, I think in terms of thinking about another round like this in August, I'm not sure that that is something that we can do. However, if there is a, a groundswell of people who would like to do that, and I know your your veins are popping right now, Dr. Bonner, um, I just think that that would be something that we would need to hear whether we want to revisit this in on our meeting on August 8th. So I am suggesting that we finish tonight and I will entertain any messages from members about further discussion on this before school starts. Member Serafi Cox. Tonight was our last chance. It's done. Okay. I'm, I'm really disappointed. And, um, you know, I, I think um, I took the initiative to make a motion. And I understand that this is really hard work and, like, it, it can, it feels really overwhelming and complicated, but like, I know other members that you, you can do this stuff too. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to come down to like one or two school committee members. And in, on my time on school committee, it's been just a few school committee members who have, uh, who have done that taken. I'm not saying that you all are bad school committee members. I'm just saying like, um, I can't do it again. So, and, and I can't ask Dr. Bonner to do it again. I can't ask the district to do it. No, okay. tonight was, was it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll make a motion to adjourn. Do we have a second for that? Okay. okay. Before we adjourn, is there, um, Member Davis, did you have something to say? Yeah, I guess, I guess, um, Member Serafi Cox, I guess I just wanted to really say that I 
truly appreciate all the work that you did. I I don't think that any, at least I can only speak for myself. I truly appreciate it. It was the all, all of it or nothing part of it that made it hard because I have things circled and arrows about how about this and how about that instead and breaking things into pieces and the voting on the whole thing I had I struggled with parts of it and so that was um that's that's why I voted the way I did not because um, I hear that and I, I and I would have done my friendly amendments yeah, it's over. I'm not. I'm not. I'm okay, sorry. I'm getting emotional. Member Stein. Yeah, I. I mean, I hear that, but I share Member Sarfi Cox's frustration. Um, you all had access to the same information we did. You all had the same ability to ask questions, and if you wanted to see a different version of it, there's nothing stopping anyone from proposing it after this failed, or asking her to prevent present a different motion. Um, at this point, in a lot of our tenure, we should know how. Uh, making amendments and passing things works. And um, it's really frustrating. Um, if we're just the committee of, you know, trust the superintendent, I don't know why we're meeting or deliberating. Like we could just have four meetings a year and just line up whatever votes are and just go, yep, yep, yep. Um, we learned this last year, we don't need to really pass a budget because it doesn't matter. Like, I don't know what we're doing a lot of the time here. And I'm really frustrated that, you know, to say like, oh, it was all or nothing. You're an equal member who can make motions. You can propose anything you want to propose. And the structures of this thing are not set in that way. So, and it, it you know, it, it's. I don't think we need personal attacks here, Member Stein. Enough. I was speaking to all of us. Um, and I'm sorry that's difficult for you to hear. Member Miller. Um, so I just want to, I can only speak for myself. I have poured over this budget line by line by line. And I do take a little offense to the implication that if we don't agree with the motion and I don't I did not have a friendly amendment because I have poured over it a million times and the only things I could come up with were what I already stated in this meeting I could not figure out despite the fact that they broke my heart I under I I I couldn't figure out an alternative and I did not agree. I couldn't vote yes because I didn't agree with the whole package and I didn't have pieces. And if I have some further thoughts, I will, frankly, I will communicate with the superintendent and tell her other ideas I may come up with. But as of right now, I could not vote yes because I could not agree with all of that and I didn't have a piece of it to give you. And I'm sorry, member Serafi Cox, and you did an amazing amount of work. And I have not done the math, but I just want to say that please don't see a no as meaning that we're not thinking about this and that we haven't poured over it or delved into it because that is not the case. But I couldn't agree with the whole package and I didn't have a parcel of it to give you. So I'm sorry, but that's why I voted no. Thank you. Uh, Member Labonte. I also wanna explain that um, I came thinking we would be going over more line by line than, than a package. And so I had not done the math and the work to necessarily, I thought that would be something that we'd be doing as part of this work because I had come, I've done this sort of 360 when I went to the training, they said, you do not vote on line items. That is not something you do. 
So I said, oh, you don't vote on items. But then I came here and said, oh, actually, we do vote on items. So, okay, I got to delve in there and, and really vote on the line. So let me look at that. However, because I didn't come with a package, I didn't feel like I could say, because there are things I, I really agreed with, but I'm not sure I agreed with the whole thing. And so, and yet people don't have an appetite to discuss it further. And thus, um, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, and ultimately our job is to um, evaluate the superintendent and if the end, if these are the decisions that she's making and they don't work, then that's something that comes out in the evaluation, correct? As well as the work that we do. So I, I, I'm of several minds. I, I apologize. I did not come prepared to do that because I thought we'd be going over line by line. So, um, but that's why I voted the way I did. Thank you. I'll just also add my thanks to you, Member Serfi Cox, for your commitment and your work. And um, I, I'm concerned that people may be going away from this with the idea that there are a majority of the members of the committee that aren't um, advocating for children, because that's something that has been said to me a few times, and it's very, very hurtful and sad. And I, that's an emotion, and I understand that some people don't want to hear emotions in this, because we are elected officials, but it is something, as a, as a former educator, I have taken very, very seriously. And I also understand how challenging it is to have a community come together and, and have some understanding about what it is that we need to provide to our children. Um, I, I hope that we can pull this back together afterwards because I'm really concerned given the fact that we're facing an override and we're facing a national ed election as well. And I hope that we can find a way to come together and not be vilified and not be accused of being not on the side of children. Thank you. I'd like to have a roll call for adjournment, please. Cassie, you're, Cassie, you're muted. You're muted. That explains why no one's answering. Member Gazy. Member Serafie Cox. Yes. Member Stein. Yes. Member Hennessy. Member Miller? Yes. Member LaBounty? Yes. Member Agna? Yes. Member Davis? Yes. Member Gacy? Um, I, I, I meant I was saying yes. I must have still been muted. So. Okay. No problem. Gotcha. That's everyone. Thank you, and thank to all the, the community members who have joined us tonight. Our next meeting will be August 8th. We also have a superintendent evaluation committee meeting next um, July 29th, I believe it is, at 515. I don't have in front of me any of the future meetings, um, but I am uh, hopeful that we will just keep everyone apprised of what meetings we have, but certainly our next school committee meeting, full school committee meeting, where there is public comment, and we will be in person and on Zoom um, on August 8th, Thursday, August 8th at 6.30. Thank you. Good night. Good night.